Welcome to another adventure with Spiritual Encounters. We are here to help represent God's work, not ours. Besides the insightful biblical teachings shared by our host, Pastor Casper, we are also very blessed to be able to bring you outstanding interviews with some of the most sought after deep thinkers and voices in Christendom today, helping to make a difference in this world for Christ's sake. We want to keep it that way, to be truly effective in internal matters, truly demands on prayer and being led of the Holy Spirit. If you, like us, long to see the Lord Jesus, Yoshua, glorified here through spiritual encounters, we invite you to join the prayer team. There is nothing more exciting than participating in intercessory prayer with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are a totally faith-based ministry and so please give and support spiritual encounters as you are led. Truly Grace and Radio have a lot in common. Grace is free to us, but cost Christ an untold price, we may never fully understand this side of heaven. Radio is also free, too. It costs nothing to turn on your dial or stream audio, but it costs us a lot to stay on the air. Spiritual Encounters is almost entirely listener-supported, a privilege, but rare things in these days of big church radio corporations. We've carefully trimmed our budgets to all but wartime essentials. But operating costs are a fact of life. If you've been blessed through our programme, here are some ways you can give back as the Holy Spirit leads. Consider becoming an underwriter by contacting us or simply go to the upper room, fellowship.org and scroll down on the main page to donate. Now here is your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. And I'm your lion hearted host, Pastor Casper. Tonight, I'm very delighted to have my friends Tom Horn and Chris Putnam back with us on Spiritual Encounters. And they're one amazing team, and both excellent researchers and authors. So it's really exciting to have them on at the same time tonight. And um, of course, they're continuing to do groundbreaking work, preparing to reach all those with have ears to hear, eyes to see what's unfolding before us in these times. And if you've not read the books yet, by all means, uh, make sure you stop picking up some of the the work tonight because it's going to be fantastic. So um, I know we're going to talk about things that are going on right now with CERN, and um, some of you might know know what that is, but I'm going to let Tom and Chris talk about that, and we'll just invite them on right now. So uh, welcome Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. Great to be on with you, Casper. Hey, Casper, it's great to be back on the show with you. So um, let's just get right at it. Um, I understand this, this, this whole thing started somehow with you going on a trip to Mount Graham, the observatory in Arizona. So the question is, what caused you to want to go there in the first place and caused you to want to do this kind of research? I mean, what, And what did you learn from that experience so far? Well, you know, if I can, I'll leap in here and start out and uh, get us going, and then Chris can follow up and fix everything that I mess up. (laughs) (laughs) You know, this this entire thing was kind of weird. I mean, in a a lot of ways, you know, Chris wrote a book last year called Supernatural Worldview, and and really there's parts in his book that him and I, I think, have lived out in the sense that uh, we never set out to write a single book, let alone to write a, a, a trilogy of books, um, and time and circumstance, this whole thing with the end of the Mayan calendar in 2012, and we were out there saying some things about what the New Agers believed about that, and the subject of the prophecy of the popes came up, how that that was another thing 
that people could watch. So in 2007, 8, 9, we were saying that that was something that they could throw into the, you know, the heap with all the rest of the stuff that people were watching to see when it was going to come to an end. Um, and um, by hook or crook, Chris and I decided that we should write a book on the prophecy of the popes because no really thorough book had been written on the subject matter. And no matter what you made of it, whether you believed in it, you didn't believe in it, you thought it was a fraud or whatever, it was a historical document. It was at least 500 plus years old, if not 900 plus years old, based on you know, the, the legends around it. And so we decided to write that book. And here's what happened is, based on the writings of a Jesuit by the name of Rene Thibault, Chris found this book. And this book had been written 60-some years ago in French called The Mysterious Prophecy of the Popes. And Rene Thibault, who was a Belgian Jesuit, actually, he was an academic that worked in the church, worked in one of their universities, um, he had determined that the final pope in the list of the prophecy of the pope, pope number 112, would arrive in the year 2012. Well, that was that was pretty crazy, right? Because he wrote this thing 60 plus years ago. He died a long time ago. Chris found the book, translated it into English, and based on some of what Rene Thibault had written, we determined that Pope Benedict the 16th was going to step down. Uh, in April of 2012. This was a pretty bold prediction for us to make. And there were, of course, people out there, especially among the Roman Catholics, that were critical of what we were saying because they were saying, well, popes don't resign. You know, they die in office or whatever. Well, when Pope Benedict resigned in 2013 and then the uh, El Observatore Romano, which is the official mouthpiece media outlet for Rome, uh, admitted that he had actually officially resigned in April of 2012, the same date Chris and I had speculated that he would a year in advance. Um, people everywhere, you know, wanted to know who who was our insider in Rome and how did we have such magical knowledge and whatever. And it really was just a lot of calculations that Chris had done and Rene Thibault had done. But it was in our book. So all of a sudden, we've got people everywhere. We're on Sid Roth. We're on Jim Baker. We're on your program. We're on all of these other programs, Coast to Coast AM. And one of those programs where people had an opportunity to be able to call in and ask a question, more often than not, not only were they asking about the prophecy of the popes, but they wanted to know what we made of the Vatican being out there and their top astronomers being out there talking about aliens, because if you might recall 36 to 48 months ago, there was a lot in the media. The top astronomers for the Vatican were saying they would baptize an alien, that uh, the aliens would be our brother. And people wanted to know what we thought of that, and Chris and I determined that the only way we were ever going to be able to actually authoritatively answer that question is we were going to have to go to the top of Mount Graham in Arizona where the Vatican uh, works with NASA and Arizona State University and a, and a whole actual international team of astronomers on the top of that mountain studying deep space. And so we set that up through Arizona State University. We went to the top of Mount Graham. We met with the Jesuit who was on duty that day. We also looked at the second telescope that is up there, the radio telescope. And then finally we went to the, the top of the mountain, which is the where the large binocular telescope, the largest telescope of its kind in the world is, and that's the telescope that has what's called the Lucifer device, which is infrared technology for searching deep space. So that's how that's what happened. We it was it was really just we wrote a book and then that led to a second book called Exo Vaticana, which is the story of us going up onto the top of Mount Graham. But it's what happened when we came down off that mountain, which we can also talk about tonight, that then led to this third book on the path of the immortals. Well, I just wanted to interject. Um, reading Exo Vaticano was an amazing book. Um, sometimes it, it just seemed like you were overdoing the details, but I realized you were like in a the, in the court of law. You were just presenting a case that was ironclad. Like, um, th these are the facts. There's no way escaping it now. So it's a fantastic book. I encourage well, you. 
yeah, I mean, that's the, it, 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 that actually the credit for that goes to Chris. Chris is, he's a guy, he's like a bloodhound. You, <laughs> you would not want to get Chris Putnam on your path uh, if he was investigating you or writing an article about you. He is, he is a super detailed, thorough investigator so that at the end of it, he leaves you without a, a, a place to find a weakness in the argument. And it's just it's what he does. He's a pugilist. He's he's an apologist, and he's good at what he does. Well, he, the Lord put you together as an amazing team. So um, I, I'm just really blown away with what you've come up with. So talk about the, the Lucifer device. I mean, why would they even name it Lucifer? I mean, I, I've, I've read articles where they said, well, we didn't name the, the, you know, the device, but they paid for it. Are you there, Chris? Yeah, I'm here. Hello? He's throwing you this question, Chris. <laughs> I heard it, yeah. Um, so it's really – the Vatican is not the only player involved. That's the thing. It's not that they're paying for it because the large binocular telescope is like a $36 million telescope, and the Vatican is not putting up the money for that. That's a whole bunch of different universities and scientists around the world, and the Vatican is just one player amongst many. So the Lucifer device, from what I can tell, uh, the best answer is that the Germans named it. Uh, the Germans at the Max Planck Institute. Um, and when they were called by a reporter and asked why they wanted it to be called Lucifer, they said because a German politician, his last name is Teufel, um, which actually is the word for devil in German, um, was the one that got the funding for them to get involved in the project. And so as a way of honoring Mr. Devil, they <laughs> wanted to name the device Lucifer. Um, you know, I don't know. It's really, it's a forced acronym. It stands for Large Binocular Telescope Ultrastopic Field Unit with um, Integral Camera for Extragalactic Research. So it, it's really forced. You know, you have to think that they really wanted to call it Lucifer. And so that's why you know, if it was to just to honor this German politician named Teufel or not, they still were acknowledging the devil because his name means devil. So, mm -hmm. what, you know, no matter all the little fancy maneuvers they've made saying that we weren't really talking about the devil, but they were. But whether, I don't know that the Jesuits had anything to do with that naming. I, I kind of don't think so from what I've seen. But um, they're certainly using the device. And what they're doing with it right now is really uh, confirming some of the uh, scientific things that need to be in place for what we're talking about with portals in the book. Um, I wrote the chapter, The Science of Portals, and uh, you know, one of the articles that came out really right about the time that we were going to print um, is that all spiral galaxies might host what they call a galactic transport system, meaning that there's navigable uh, wormholes all throughout spiral galaxies. Um, and this really has a lot to do with dark matter and things of that nature. Um, they, they think one of the leading uh, theories for the existence of dark matter is it's actually matter that exists in a parallel universe that we cannot see. And so the areas where we, we pick up all this immense gravity coming through is actually massive objects in a parallel universe. Um, so they think that black holes might be where the two universes contact, and so you can actually travel between them. Now, all spiral galaxies supposedly have this dark matter in these black holes in between the spiral arms and what they call the globular clusters, and that's an area that's really gassy and dusty, and you can't see with regular light. You can't see into that with a telescope. But infrared, which is a really long frequency of radiation, can pick up objects and masses within that globular cluster. So the Lucifer device is what they use to look for dark matter and to look for possibly these um, wormholes between what they think, believe might be parallel universes. So it really is um, intimately involved in that kind of research, which fit really nicely into the topics of the book that we just put out on the path of the immortals. Well, that, that's a lot to take in, I'm sure. <laughs> But um, un unlike normal matter, I mean, dark matter doesn't, from what I understand, doesn't interact with electromagnetic, le electromagnetic force, so it means it's not really absorbed, uh, emits well, light. 
So it's extremely hard to spot. So how scientists have been able to infer the, um, the existence of well, dark matter from I a gravitational they, point. Okay. Sure. They, like, one of the ways they know it is that the spiral galaxy spins at a certain rate. And, you know, there's a, there's, they do the physical calculations using classical physics of what it should go at and what the gravitational force, what kind of force it would apply. So you would expect it to go at a certain rate, but it's actually going a lot faster than you would predict given um, the mass that we can account for, um, the planets, the stars, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a large body of mass that's unaccounted for, and they can't see it. That's why they call it dark matter. But it has to be there uh, for the mechanical uh, movements that we observe uh, to be true. So they, they know that there's something emitting a gravitational force, uh, but they can't see it. And so they call it dark matter. Now, this is where the parallel universe idea explains why you can't see it. Um, it's in a parallel universe. So, like, if you think about a black hole, the gravity is so strong in a black hole that light cannot escape from it. That's why it's called a black hole. That's why you, when you look at that area of space, you don't see anything. You can't really see a black hole. But what they see is like a big accretion disk that's like a vortex of dust spiraling in towards the black hole. Okay, so that, that they detect it by all the good stuff that's kind of getting sucked into it. So they see that, but they can't actually see the black hole. Well, with a parallel universe, they think gravitons, which are these uh, particles they believe are responsible for gravity, although they've never really observed one. The theory is that gravitons can pass from universe to universe in the bigger reality that they call the bulk. So within the bulk, you have these sheets that are parallel to each other, and these are membrane universes. We're one of those, and there's a sheet next to us, and its gravity, its gravitons affect our gravity, but we can't see it because the light only stays on that sheet. So within that four-dimensional space-time, the light cannot escape it, but the gravity can. So that's why we can detect, that's the leading theory right now for why we detect uh, dark matter. It's called brain world theory. Um, and it's really the, the main scientist that's offering that right now is Paul Steinhardt at uh, Princeton University. Hmm. Yeah, in fact, uh, to go along with that, if, if a person wants to read kind of some of what Chris was talking about, besides our book on the path of the immortals, which in which Chris goes into that, um, there's an article up at Forbes right now. It was published about a week ago, uh, and the title of the article is actually uh, How to Find a Parallel Universe, CERN Booth Data Intelligence. That's the name of the article. People can Google that and read it and read about the scientists and how they're discussing in somewhat certain terms over there their faith that CERN is actually on the cusp of discovering evidence of these parallel worlds by using, well, hopefully by locating, authenticating, and then, and then watching what uh, gravitons do. Gravitons, as Chris said, is a theoretical particle, but we know that gravity is made of particles. We know it's made of something, so they call it a graviton. And with gravity being the weak force in nature, uh, and this can also kind of go not just to brain world theory, but also to string theory. The idea on string theory is that each particle has a string that connects it to this universe that loops around it and connects it back to this universe on the other side. But they think that um, gravity particles, gravitons, have a closed loop system that allows them to escape this uh, reality into another parallel universe. And so one of the things they're doing at CERN in some of the first experiments that they did a couple of years ago before they closed it down, um, they would collide these protons together at incredible rates and watch them burst apart of their subatomic particles. And they think what were gravitons were disappearing somewhere. They didn't know where they were going. They're tracing the, 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 the particle, uh, uh, whatever they call them, like the atlas over there, the particle detectors, were tracing the light trails, if you will, that come off these subatomic particles when they burst off from the protons. But some of them were doing things that they didn't really altogether expect in the sense that they seemed to just go somewhere else. They seemed to disappear. They couldn't be traced. And they think that's gravitons escaping into a parallel reality. And so now what they're doing, in fact, they're doing them right now, I guess, is, is the most powerful experiments that have ever been conducted on Earth where they're colliding protons at nearly the speed of light. So you've got this 17-mile-long uh, uh, particle collider 
which is accelerating protons uh, at nearly the speed of light. And then they, I think they use magnetic forces to do this, but they compress the trail that these two, you know, these two directional protons are traveling down to about the, the width of a human hair. And that's where they collide them. And they say that they're up, upwards of 600 million collisions per second is happening in the particle collider. And as these things break apart, they're looking for things like quarks, they're looking for gluons, but they're also looking for gravitons. Um, and I would recommend that people go to YouTube and look up, there's a documentary by Brian Greene, the really popular uh, you know, uh, particle physicist out there right now. He's got a documentary called The Theory of Everything, documentary on string theory. So you can look that up. And fast forward 33 minutes into that documentary, and listen as the physicists there begin explaining how if they can prove that gravitons are escaping into a parallel universe, then gravitons might also become the vehicle that we can use to send messages through from our universe to this parallel universe, kind of like stringing together digital strings of ones and zeros or computer code or high-tech Morse code. We could use gravitons to put them together in some kind of mathematical equation and send them through into another reality in the hopes that maybe something on that other side would signal us back. And you might recall when uh, Sergio Bertolucci, who's the director of CERN, was talking in the press a couple of years ago, and he said we might send something through to a parallel world, or we might open a doorway that lets something come through into our world. And that's Essentially, that's what he was talking about, the fact that gravitons might be escaping into these parallel worlds that Chris was just talking about. Well, that goes along with some scriptures we can think of, concerts uh, about the beast coming from the earth, traveling through. Um, when, when you came down from Mount Graham, you learned about the Apache, um, why they filed a lawsuit against that? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so Chris and I, we go up to Mount Graham, we come down off of Mount Graham, and we set our book, Exo Vaticana. Um, I should also uh, tell your listeners something right now. They can get the first book uh, by me and Chris Putnam, Petros Romanus, free. They can get the second book by us, Exo Vaticana, free. But, they, but they'll have to hurry. And, 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 and together with some other books, several other books, an audio book, and a bunch of stuff, like $200 worth of stuff. They can get that at skywatchtv.com, and they'll see the big ad up on the top. If the big ad's gone, it's because the giveaway has come to an end, and it is going to come to an end any day now. It's only going to run for a few days, maybe stop tomorrow, the next day, but it's going to end uh, fairly quickly. But if they go there right now, they could get these other books we're talking about, uh, plus some other stuff for nothing. Anyway, <clears throat> so we come down off the mountain. We send the book Exo Vaticana to the typesetter. Um, and then Chris and I are out there doing various media, doing various radio shows. And I had said that, um, and this was an assumption on my part, that the Apache had joined um, the, uh, there was a lawsuit. Environmentalists in uh, Arizona had filed to try to stop NASA and the Vatican from building the observatory on the top of that mountain. And I had said that the Apache had joined at that lawsuit because Mount Graham was for them sacred ground in the sense that their forefathers had lived and died on that mountain and therefore it was something kind of like a graveyard, uh, holy ground. And they didn't want people up there with big equipment tearing the mountain up where they'd be, you know, crunching the bones of their elders. So I had said that on a program and was contacted after the fact by somebody that said they were a member of the Apache tribe. And I vetted all this and made sure it was true before we went any further with it. Said they were a member of the Apache tribe and they wanted us to know that the main reason that they had joined this lawsuit uh, against the Vatican and against NASA to try to stop them from building on Mount Graham is that the mountain itself, Mount Graham, is one of the four holiest mountains in all of the world to all American indigenous people. And it is because that mountain is, in their belief system, a stargate, a portal, a doorway, a sacred uh, geographical location 
where entities have moved in and out of our three-dimensional reality, or four if you had time, uh, but had moved in and out of our reality since the dawn of time. And Casper, when I got that contact, when I got that email, I mean, the conspiracy meter in my head went into the red zone because now I was thinking, wow, okay, wait a minute. Now this is kind of starting to make a little bit of sense because until then I had thought, why would the Vatican and why would NASA, why would they spend so much time fighting all the way up into federal court to build on the top of Mount Graham? Why not just go to another mountain? I mean, there's plenty of mountains and plenty of states that could have given the same environmental conditions and the same elevation states that probably would have loved to have had their uh you know their activity in that state and the commerce that might come with it why would they go through this huge hassle of fighting to get on the top of that mountain but when the apache said it's because that mountain is a stargate it is a portal man then my thoughts went back to malachi martin father malachi martin in 1997 when Art Bell is interviewing him on the late-night talk show Coast to Coast AM, and he says, Father Martin, tell me why did the Vatican force its way onto the top of a mountain in Arizona, and what are they doing up there? And Malachi Martin said something cryptic. He said it is because at the highest levels of Vatican governance and, and jurisprudence, he said they know what is approaching the earth, and that it will be of the utmost importance in coming years. So Malachi Martin had implied that they were on the top of that mountain because from that mountain, maybe specifically from that mountain, they're able to see through a window, a doorway, something that is approaching the earth, and they are monitoring it from the top of that mountain. So uh, that, that kind of then changed everything, and what happened then led to Chris and I over the last year and a half being on this adventure called On the Path of the Immortals, where Chris went with a film crew to the southern tip of the ancient Anasaze uh, Trail down there into Sedona, Arizona, and other places. I went with another film crew. We went up to the Four Corners. We wanted to talk to the Native Americans. We wanted to find out about their most ancient stories, their, their belief systems, and actually, what we found was phenomenal. It was incredible. Uh, but it's also astonishing how often you see the footprints of the Vatican showing up, in, not just on the top of Mount Graham, but in Sedona and everywhere else, essentially, show it, showing up where they have their interest, their footprint there uh, for studying this kind of phenomenon. Well, it sounds a bit like... Um you know, behind the Pope, maybe some other powers that are actually controlling things. Um, I mean, we're, we're kind of seeing that there's a multi-dimensional spiritual war going on here from what you're, you're sharing with us, connecting Mount Graham with, with CERN and maybe some of the things that have gone on, like the 9-11 um, and, and tragedies with the, the portals and the ET thing coming. Um so obviously they're trying to open this gateway. This uh, and and you, you've, I've been no, I've heard you talk about this before. Maybe when we were talking, but um, obviously this is going on. We have biblical references. You know, Jesus going up to the mountain on the Transfiguration, Jacob's ladder, and that sort of thing. Um, so, how do you see this playing out? Um, at this point in time? That well, um, I'll let Chris talk so that I don't dominate the show, but uh, Chris could also address what he found related to the Vatican in the Sedona area. And uh, and actually, when, he, when Chris was in Sedona, he took a film crew with him, professional uh, photographers and, a, and a, a camera operator. They actually filmed things, which I think were coming through uh, the portal there. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, I took a, a crew, I took my wife and a, a professional photographer named Chris Florio, and we went to Sedona, Arizona, mainly because I'm doing a lot of research on the Internet and reading some of the books. Uh, there's an area that's accessible there known as the Bradshaw Ranch uh, in the desert of Sedona that ufologists and paranormal investigators you know, if you read the literature, it really sounds almost like you're guaranteed to see something if you go there. So, you know, 
that coupled with the fact that Sedona is like the new age capital of the world. It's full of spiritualism and um, psychics and all kinds of Eastern religious ideas mixed with indigenous Indian belief. Um, so you have all this intermixed witchcraft, all kinds of sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then you have these vortex energy spots on the red rocks and around the mountains of Sedona. And these are areas where people go to meditate and, and do various Eastern spiritual practices. Um, interestingly, about 30 years or so before the New Age movement kicked in and they named all these vortex areas, uh, the Vatican already knew about it and um, built a chapel of the Holy Cross up on the side of the mountain in the 1950s. And um, it was really a, a really a modern building um, named after uh, the famous architect uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, one of his students, I think, designed the building. But it's a really it's a it's a beautiful uh, structure built into the side of the mountain, but. Of course, they built that on national forest land, so they had to get a permit from the government. But it's really interesting how the, the Vatican's able to build uh, their own facilities on areas that most of us um, consider parklands and that no one else can really access. You don't see any Baptist churches built on these national park uh, structures like this, but the Vatican seems to be able to do it. With Mount Graham, they, they went around the Forestry Service completely and had John McCain basically signed by Congressional Fiat their right to build that uh, facility up on the mountain. So they didn't even go through any of the environmental protection uh, things that are supposed to be required by law. Um, so I don't know how the Vatican's able to do that, but they consistently pull that off and they get themselves um, in place in these strategic areas. But what we, we discovered out there at the Bradshaw Ranch is that we were able to capture what people call orbs on two high-quality cameras at simultaneously. So it wasn't a camera phenomenon. It wasn't a drop of moisture on the lens. It wasn't a dust particle that one camera just picked up because we got it from different angles on video and still photography at the same time. In fact, my photographer actually saw an orb with the naked eye without even a camera. He just saw one with his own eyesight, and uh, it really shocked him. Um, we also able, were able to capture a large, very pointy, triangular-shaped craft flying over the desert, absolutely silent, way in the distance. So it looked like it was really large. Uh, we actually captured it on film by accident and uh, didn't realize we even got this UFO until we got home. And all I can really say about that is it's an unidentified flying object. I don't know for sure if it's you know, a terrestrial craft like the TR-3B. Steve Quayle thinks it might be a TR-3B. Um, I don't know about that. I don't, the lights don't seem to match what I've seen of other TR-3Bs, but you know, I don't have any experience with, with actually knowing what they look like, so I don't know. Uh, I would say it's an unidentified uh, craft at this point, and I've got different opinions from different experts, so it just remains unidentified. Um, but fascinating that, just as advertised, you know, we went from North Carolina on one side of the country all the way to Sedona, Arizona, and we did get a UFO on photograph, and we saw orbs flying around. I got them on video and still photography. So it lived up to its reputation. Now, what I find interesting is the, one of the books that you know I read before I went out there, this lady, Linda Bradshaw, who lived at the Bradshaw Ranch, had seen Bigfoot. She saw strange creatures, um, like little alien-type beings. She, she saw... Uh, Beings that look things that look like dinosaurs, uh, and you know when you read any other literature from around the world where people are talking about this idea of dimensional portals, you see the same sort of descriptions. Um, another famous case would be the Skinwalker Ranch uh, that was on coast to coast a lot, but they described the same sort of thing. People saw UFOs, they saw weird creatures, and you know all kinds of paranormal phenomena. Uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, in the uh, 1960s, when the Silver Bridge collapsed, uh, this was the famous Mothman prophecies case that John Keel wrote about. But it, for like a short period of time, just a couple of years, UFO sightings went up through the roof. People saw a large uh, pterodactyl-like thunderbird flying around the area. Um, people started seeing this Mothman character appearing. Um, so, you know, you get a cluster of paranormal phenomena associated with a certain area for a certain period of time. And I think this is indicative of what we're talking about when we say a portal opened. 
Sometimes they're temporary. Some of them seem to be in permanent locations, like the Bermuda Triangle, which is really famous off the coast of Florida down there. So the Sedona area does seem to be a portal. It seems to have happened in the late 80s. I think it's a reasonable assumption to think that the things like the harmonic convergence in 1987, where thousands of New Agers uh, meditated together for global awareness, that an event like that might have opened up some sort of otherworldly portal in that area. That would not... I don't think I think that's a good hypothesis. That's kind of where I'm going. I don't have any evidence that can prove that, but I know that thousands of people gathered in Sedona and they all held hands around Bell Rock and waited for the mothership to break out and all this other crazy stuff. But you know, there's a lot of power in people coming together um, in, in spirit like that. Now, whether it's good or bad, but you know, I think in this case it wasn't good. They probably beckoned the attention of these fallen angels, and for that reason, I think that probably did open some kind of gate around the city of Sedona. I think it is good and bad, and I also think that there is evidence in the sense that, you know, uh, Chris, you went there with the film crew. You took so that you would catch ca- a camera angle from two different angles. Sure. You filmed, you filmed orbs. You filmed the V-shaped craft. But in addition to that, I was very impressed with the charts that you showed that showed the magnetic anomalies. Right. Well, the thing I couldn't prove is, I guess I can't prove that the New Age movement caused it. That's really what I was talking about with that. Yeah, but but I I mean, there is That's a working theory. But there is definitely something there, and you did prove that, because the magnetic magnetic anomalies shows a Sedona Sedona area completely off the chart. Yeah, that was one uh, of the things that I looked at right at the beginning was... John Keel said that these areas are famously associated with magnetic anomalies, and he actually suggested that you get the map. So I got the map, and there it was. And Sedona is literally one of the hottest areas in the country as far as geomagnetic anomalies. So there is there is some science behind it, even though even then we still wouldn't be able to say like the, with that with that gigantic uh, Phoenix light like craft that hovered silently over you guys, which we got on film. Uh, you can't say it's otherworldly or it's top secret craft or whatever, but definitely there was phenomenon. And it seemed to be, it's, it, it, to me, I had the feeling when you came back and you brought all that film back with you, I had the feeling that you were, you were there either at a time when th- there was a ton of stuff, I mean a plethora of, of uh, supernaturalism, activity, whatever, that was going on, or we are at a time where the gates are starting to leak open and this kind of activity is increasing uh, around the world. And one of the things that I would want to say, um, <clears throat> Casper, is that I know your audience, uh, you know, a lot of your audience wants to know, okay, but how does this line up with the Bible? And you mentioned a moment ago, uh, you know, Moses on Mount Sinai. The, the idea around this, uh, what Chris and I have done, and, and again, I want to emphasize that Chris is the theologian. Tom Horn's just the, I'm a publisher. Uh, I'm the hype guy. I'm whatever. (laughs) Chris is the theologian. And I'm thankful to have him because he keeps my feet on the ground and makes sure that we verify this stuff through the lens of Scripture, through the lens of biblical prophecy. And I, you know, I pastored for 20 some years, and yet I was amazed that when for the first time I actually stopped and said to myself, okay, but is this biblical? And really looked at this phenomenon, this idea that there are gateways of the earth, what the Apache were saying about Mount Graham, the idea that there could be strategic locations on the earth that are, for want of a better term, a doorway, a gateway, a stargate. It doesn't really matter, portal. It doesn't really matter you know, what word you put on it. It's the idea that at that location, something, what, it's thinner, the veil is thinner, I don't know what it is, but, there's, but, there's, but it's a location where supernaturalism se- seems to move in and out of Earth's reality. Now, the one you gave, Casper, is one uh, uh, example of mountainous locations like Mount Graham, but in this case Mount Sinai, that is related to this kind of activity where Moses is ordered, if he's going to talk to God, he's got to go to the top of, of Mount Sinai. When Jesus returns, his feet, like you said, touch the top of Mount uh, Olives, and he descends down into the plain. Mount Hermon is another one of those places where in the days of Jared, according to the book of Enoch, which is still in many uh, orthodox versions of the Bible, orthodox versions of the Bible, 
Uh, the Book of Jubilees, which is part of the Orthodox versions of the Bible, talks about how in the days of Jared, these angels descended, these watchers that fell. And Chris does a fabulous job. In fact, part of, I have to say part of my favorite uh, part of this new book, On the Path of the Immortals, is the work that Chris did on the fiery flying seraphim, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But this idea that you have these reptilian-like watchers that descended in the days of Jared, they too were part of this uh, great deception, according to the book of Enoch, but they came down on Mount Hermon. And that those examples go on and on. Jesus talks about Jonah going into the belly of the earth. Jonah goes down into the belly of the earth through in the bottom of the uh, sea into an area called Baravach, which means the city of gates. He goes through the gates into the earth. Jesus goes down into the earth through the gates. Jesus comes back up out of the earth. He's got keys to the gates. The book of Revelation 9 talks about in the future, a, a powerful angel comes down to the earth, comes down from heaven. He's got the keys to the gateways, um, and he opens them up, and Apollyon, Abaddon, the destroyer, uh, comes up out of the earth, as well as the locust horde that comes up out of the earth. The book of Isaiah 13 talks about the gates of the earth in the end times opening up. And note there, in Isaiah 13, he doesn't say open the gate, singular, he says, open the gates, plural, ye rulers, I give command and I bring them, giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. So there are giants within the earth, and Isaiah prophesies about this, other texts prophesy about this, I think Joel might be prophesying about this, um, uh, the book of Revelation chapter 9 talks about this, these gateways of the earth in the end times are going to open and that's what this book does. On the Path of the Immortals says that one of the most overlooked aspects of end times biblical prophecy is the idea that the earth is dynamic, that there are super powerful things that are inside the earth, like it's a prison. This is a celestial prison that's floating through space. But the time is coming when those gateways of the earth are going to open like I think they did once before according to the Apache Indian, according to the Navajo tribes, are, are going to open again, and these giants are going to return uh, in the end times uh, for uh, judgment. Now, very quickly, the reason I said that my favorite part of the book is what Chris wrote about the fiery flying seraphim. The, the seraphim are interesting. Um, one of the questions, actually, that's asked, and I'll let Chris answer this in a moment, but one of the questions that's asked is, when you guys say you're on the path of the immortals, what do you even mean by the immortals? And Chris can explain how one of the immortals that we were in pursuit of is reptilian. And it shows up in early American history, but also shows up in biblical history. Uh, and these are, ver these are part of the very powerful watchers that came down to the earth in ancient times. Before Chris answers that, um, Tom, you had shared with me before that when CERN had the collider going full speed, um, there was reports like in the Netherlands and um, certain areas where people were seeing through a veil and described Nephilim-type creatures for a moment. Um, I, I know there's a lot of people concerned that something like that, um, something bigger than that may happen this September. Um, can you shed some light on that as well for us? Well, I can't shed any light on whether it is going to happen. I can tell you that when CERN fired up a couple of years ago, and remember, it fired up, they tried to do their most powerful experiments, they had an electrical shortage or something, and they closed, it was an emergency shutdown of CERN. Um, good, good thing, maybe, right? They didn't um, create a, a, a black hole that, you know, sucked up the earth in it or something. But, yeah, the next day, because the reason I remember this, and I don't remember all the details, but I remember part of it because Steve Quayle and I were on, uh, it, it might have, I don't think it was the Hagman show, I think it might have been, um, oh, well, anyway, it was one of the other shows that Steve was guest hosting. And, um, and we were talking that night about, okay, today CERN is doing these experiments, blah, blah, blah. 
The next day, blog sites all over the Internet were talking about people seeing the appearance of giants that were coming through doorways. And this was happening all across the Netherlands. Some of this was in Europe. Um, and, and we were not able, of course, to vet whether those reports were real, whether it was people just responding to the program that we did. But there seemed to be so many of them that just purely by the numbers alone, it seemed to testify that something very strange had happened and happened very quickly. It was almost as if these doorways opened very quickly. People saw things. It all went away, and then that was the end of that. Here's the thing that you have to keep in mind. Um, earlier, Chris mentioned, I think, uh, you know, that in these locations, like in Sedona and other places around the world, in those locations, like. Um, uh, the uh, uh, old ranch, not the one he mentioned, the other one. Um, I can't think of the name, but the um, anyway, the ranch here that the, the the guy that has the big contracts with the U.S. military took over. Um, not I'm the Skinwalker. The Skinwalker. Skin thank you. Yeah, yeah Skinwalker skin Ranch. Yeah. Yeah, Skinwalker and places like that. There, there have been these variety of shape shifting monsters, cryptids, um, and cryptids is just from the Greek crypto. It means to hide, something that's hidden. It's hidden behind a doorway. It's hidden somewhere, and and the existence of it is kind of difficult to prove because of its ability to apparently move in and out of Earth's dimension, man's visible spectrum, the human range of sight. And so... It could be uh, the Yeti in the Himalaya. It could be Bigfoot Sasquatch of the Pacific Northwest. It could be the Loch Ness Monster in Scot uh, Scotland. Uh, but when you, when you separate the hoaxes from that phenomenon, there have been literally tens of thousands of reputable people down through time and around the world. And, we're, and by the way, this includes clergy, it includes professionals, it includes military, it includes law enforcement per, uh, personnel, even anthropologists, the so people who study this kind of stuff, have seen, even found, what they claim to be biological samples, such as hair and footprint evidence. Uh, and they've filmed, they've recorded the creature's unidentified, uh, uh, unidentifiable language vocalizations. I listened to some of those uh, just recently that were very strange. But up until now, we have failed to capture a single physical specimen unless if it was captured, it was something that was spirited away and we weren't able to see it. Uh, and often, the other thing about this is witness testimony often includes uh, creatures of fantastic sizes from enormous dragons in the sea to these giant bipeds like the Bigfoot that range in height from 8 to 12 feet tall, footprints up to 24 inches uh, long, uh, and, uh, and so on. And then there's some, um, uh, like, the retching smell of sulfuric odor, um, wrapping on walls and windows in some of the homes nearby. This goes back to... to Chris Putnam's new book, The Supernatural Worldview. And if a person hasn't read that book, oh my gosh, do yourself a favor. This is one of the most important books that's, that I've ever had the privilege of being involved with publishing. I didn't write any part of it. The Supernatural Worldview that could explain some of this wrapping on walls and windows, shadows, ghostly lights inside and outside homes, disembodied voices, levitation, disappearance of furniture. So... There is a phenomenon, and too many people around the world have experienced this phenomenon for us just to let it go lightly and say it's just a bunch of hoodoo and people are making it up. There is something about strategic locations and, and much of the phenomenon that has been recorded in those locations, and yet because we've never captured a Bigfoot, it actually lends more to the credibility that gates are opening and closing. Things are moving out, and then they move back out of our, our reality. And in the book On the Path of the Immortals, Chris explains a lot using very simple to understand terms about flat world and the idea that if something was to touch down in a two-dimensional reality, how it would affect those who are in a two-dimension that can't understand three dimensions and four dimensions and so on. And you know the thing that I find 
really fascinating, and I think it really supports that a lot of the ideas that we're talking about are biblical, is that you see like that passage Tom mentioned in the Septuagint of Isaiah 13, where it says that the gates are going to open, giants are coming to fill my wrath. But as you read through the chapter, you find that as Babylon is judged, and you know most futurists, premillennialists, like I know Casper is, and, and we both are, as far as our eschatology, you know, we hold that um, that all these events are, are, are going to happen in, in the future, and that we believe that you know Satan and these angels are going to be thrown down to earth, as it says in Revelation 12, and, and that these gates will open. Well, it says in, that this Babylon, which must correspond somewhere, because uh, it's a day of the Lord event, with probably the mystery Babylon that we read about in Revelation 17 and 18. So you have Jeremiah chapter 50, 51, you have Isaiah chapters 13 and 14, and Revelation 17 and 18, all describing the destruction of some place called Babylon, uh, not necessarily only Iraq, it could be a bigger constituent of mystery Babylon. Um, so we see that it's going to be destroyed and that monsters will dwell there. It says that goat demons, satyrs, will dwell there. It says that, you know, that these divine beings that are castaways, these fallen angels, will find this deserted place where humans no longer dwell ever again, where it'll be haunted by these cryptids. You know, it's really interesting that, you know, you go to Sedona, people are seeing Bigfoot, they're seeing these weird creatures, and they're seeing UFOs. You know, like I said, all these things are characteristic um, of these portal areas. And so, you know, if we're going to study paranormal and supernatural phenomenon, it makes sense to go to the areas where it's most concentrated. And, you know, it's not, you know, terribly much of a leap in logic to hypothesize that the reason why it's concentrated in that area is that there is some kind of gateway to this supernatural realm. So when, you know, I talk about these theories of parallel universes that the scientists are talking about, I'm not adopting their worldview. I'm not adopting naturalism, but I'm saying, hey, these ideas that they're talking about are consistent with what the Bible has been saying all along. And what they're saying is that our experiential reality, our everyday reality we experience, is just a small subset of a much bigger spiritual reality that has powers and principalities and God and angels and seraphim and cherubim and untold beings that, that, that may exist in this other realm. So it's not that surprising that scientists are coming up with theories trying to explain mass that they can't see. You know, you look at, you know, when... Um, Elijah opened up the eyes of his servant and said, let him see, Lord, and he saw flaming chariots and armies all around him that he could not see 30 seconds before. Um, so that tells me that there is mass that we can detect that maybe we can't see. There is something that's like dark matter, and it might very well be alive even, <laughs> as Elijah well showed him. Well, we're basically um, out of time, but uh, it's been fantastic, and I would just say that it's sort of like, um, you know, we've got water, we can change the molecules and speed it up or slow it down. We can get ice or we can get steam. So things aren't as real right. as other people think. But um, change Tom, form. Yeah. Right. I, we've got so much more to talk about. We'll have to have you both on again. Um, but let's just encourage everybody to make their peace with, with the Lord Jesus tonight, if you haven't so far, because... We're really getting to that point in time. Um, the scriptures are coming alive for us. Ancient prophecies are being fulfilled left and right, and the church needs to wake up to this as well. Um, Tom, would you lead us in a, in a quick little prayer here for anyone that still needs to make their peace with the Lord? Absolutely. Um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this privilege to get to be with Casper tonight and be on his radio program with Chris Putnam and I. And we do ask that anybody that might be listening to this program tonight that has not yet made a decision to serve Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would do that this very night, that they would accept Jesus into their heart, accept him as their Lord, accept him as their Savior, repent of their sins, and turn to him, because he is the mighty Christ. He is the one that can make everything in their life make sense. Uh, God and who can also give them eternal life in the life that is to come. We pray that that would happen in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you so much, Chris and Tom. I look forward to the next time we get together. And um, till next week, everyone be blessed and keep looking up. Good night. All right, Casper, I got to run. You're the friend of sinners that transforms us into saints. Without any restraint You're the only way The truth and life That makes me free